the first reading from the Acts of the Apostles, pre, pre, this does not bode well for the rest of the homily, <laughs> paints a pretty good picture of what life in the early church was like, right? So we have this idea that uh, there was a common life, the breaking of bread, they held everything in common, they gathered daily, everybody gave of their own means for each other. There was an early, not political, but an early kind of Christian communism. They would sell their possessions and give to wh whoever was in need. That there was this sense of an ideal state of the church. And we should also recognize that didn't stay that long for, I mean, it didn't stay that way for very long, right? that even in the Acts of the Apostles, we hear of conflict and divisions, that we see that there are other elements to the reality of the life of the church besides this early period of ideal realization of God's love, right? So we see that's, that it does kind of, there's more turmoil to it than that. Have you ever heard the phrase, the honeymoon is over? Sometimes I see this idea with young couples. And uh, since I've had so many weddings over the last two years, I've had the opportunity to, to talk to a lot of couples. And there was for a while in popular culture this idea of the soulmate. Have you ever heard that idea? Like you have to find your soulmate, right? And once you find your soulmate, everything will be smooth. <laughs> kind of like once you find faith, everything will be smooth. Right? And we know that that's not the way a soulmate works. Because what happens is if you think that once you find your soulmate, that everything will be smooth, then when you hit the troubles, you think, I found the wrong one. I need to get another one. I made a mistake. Right? When we, if we think, the, once we have faith, if everything's going to be smooth, and then we hit troubles, we may doubt, we may reject, we may turn away from God. But instead, we need to recognize that for a couple who are married, that they become soulmates over their lifetime, that they build that relationship, that they build that love, right? Yes, the honeymoon is over, but that's when the real love begins, right? That, that, that we have to recognize that pattern, that commitment, that strength of the union of husband and wife, but also the strength of the union with God and his people. Just because things don't go right doesn't mean God has abandoned us. He walks with us through it. In the second reading, we hear in the first book of Peter that he talks about how our faith may be tested Right? We have this incredible joy, but your faith may be tested. It may be refined. It may be proved genuine in the fires of this life. And we should recognize that there is a place in which we grow in our faith as we walk through the difficult times. When it's easy to believe, there may not be much to that belief. When it's hard to believe, that belief grows. Now, I, I know I am influenced a little bit by the fact that I went to the Air Force Academy, right? Where pretty much, if it was easy, it wasn't worth doing, right? Like you had to, the more, more difficult it was, the better it was, the more valuable it was. And that's not always true either, right? But we have to recognize that to build a faith, to endure trials, is to believe in the midst of the difficulty. When it is most challenging to do the right thing, when it's the hardest to be loving, when it is the most difficult to forgive, that's the moment that faith grows. That's the moment that we recognize our dependence upon God, our trust in Him that's necessary, that in the midst of the trial and the struggle or the most difficult moment to do the most difficult thing, we can't do it on our own, that we need God. So we come to Thomas in the gospel reading, right? 
We come to Thomas, and the, really this is before the gift of the Holy Spirit. We hear of that gift here in this reading, but they're, they're afraid, they're in turmoil, there's confusion, right? There's all this is going on, and Jesus shows up. Peace be with you, he says. He is the bringer of peace into our hearts and into our lives. But Thomas, poor old Thomas, everybody say poor Thomas. He was out doing something else, right? He was busy about other things maybe, I don't know, running errands, he didn't have time to pray, he was stuck in traffic, I don't know what it was. But he wasn't there. And so they're trying to convince him, hey, Thomas, this wonderful thing has happened, right? Jesus is alive. He'd been hurt. And so he's like, no way will I believe unless I touch him, unless I go into his wounds, unless I am enveloped in that, I will not believe. Jesus comes and fulfills his need, right? He comes to him in the midst of all that he's asking for, demanding for from God, God desires for Thomas to believe. How many of you have ever had a doubt? God desires for you to believe. You don't have to convince God that you need to believe. You don't have to convince him about any of that. He desires to pour out himself in your life. He desires for you to come. He knows you can't do it on your own, but he desires to be with us, to be united with us. He desires to be present to us, to be loved by us as he can love us fully. We recognize, and we should see this parallel when Jesus comes the first time to his disciples. You heard what he said. He said, receive, he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. We should remember the early creation of Adam in the book of Genesis, when God breathes the breath of life into Adam and he comes to life. The gift of the Spirit, the new life in Jesus, breathed into his disciples, recreates them. Jesus is the bringer of peace and the one who creates us anew. We shouldn't be stuck in the ideal, right? To think everything's going to always go okay. And we should recognize that in the midst of our dependence and need upon God, our faith will grow. That God will help us to do the most difficult thing at the most difficult time. But we also need to recognize that Jesus desires to be with us and to give us new life. As we come to this Eucharist, as we come here, the breath of the Spirit, the breath of God is breathed once more into us. And it is always a new beginning and a new day. It's always a moment for a fresh start, for a reboot, right? It's always a moment today for us to move in the right direction, whatever direction we've been heading. As we come to this Eucharist, as we celebrate divine mercy and God's great gift of mercy for us, the the proof that he desires to give us his forgiveness, to give us his love, to be reconciled and united to us, as we celebrate that, we recognize that God gives us all we need. Namely, God gives us himself.